Hello, welcome to this episode of Quaker Dad. In this episode, I want to do something that I've been wanting to do for a long while, and so I'm glad to get it started. And so this is going to be hopefully another kind of playlist thing, and it's on the history of Quakerism. I think it's something that I personally find very interesting. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, coming into Quakerism or wanting to find out more about Quakerism, that's something that they kind of want to know. So I thought, well, let's give them a video for that. Now, first and foremost, it's got to be put out that I am not an academic historian, um, but i am read a lot and I'll share that with you, but do not necessarily take my, what I say, as the be all and end all. If you read in much more um, academic writing, something different than what I say, go with them. They'll be right. But, and let me know so I can change things. But my idea is to just to give a rough layout of the history of Quakerism, where it's come from, and what that maybe means for Quakerism today. What I'll try and do is, as much as I can, make sure that in the notes there are links and um, suggested reading, should you want to find out more. Um, most of what I'm going to be talking about mainly comes from the introduction to Quakerism by Ben Pink Dandelion, but also um, Early Quakers and Their Theolo Theological Thought, which is a cracking book um, by Ben Pink Dandelion again, and Stephen Angle. Um, again, all those in the notes, but if there's anything else, I'll throw it in there as well. So in this very first episode, I'm wanting to talk about not necessarily the, even the origins of Quakerism, not there yet, I'm gonna really pad this out, but what I'm wanting to talk about is maybe the influences of, on Quakerism. What were the things that led to Quakerism coming into being in any form? On this point, I think just something that we might need to put into context as well, um, there may be some Quakers that say that Quakerism began uh, through Jesus's ministry in the 30s AD and has been, was lost and then recaptured in the 17th century. Um, certainly some early friends definitely thought this. Um, and uh, so uh, William Penn famously had a book called Primitive Quaker, uh, sorry, Primitive Christianity Revived, in which that's what he thought Quakerism was, that Quak Quakerism was this primitive Christianity revived, re remembered after all that, basically that the, even the apostles got it wrong and uh, it all just went downhill terribly. And then now we're back to square one again. And I'm not saying that that view is not valid. Um, I I'm not sure necessarily I, well, I'm not saying that I don't think Quakerism comes from um, the teachings of Jesus, obviously not. Um, I'm saying it's maybe kind of Christianity relinked to experience and not on tradition. I think, like with all things, even with Quakers, uh, I think that human humans have a tendency to make traditions of things and to make idols of things, I suppose, and by doing so, lose the connection with what it's actually about. Um, and so whilst I, I think, you know, if, if I think there are some people that might say, if, especially if you look at in Paul's writings about the Church of Corinth, that that has some Quakerish aspects. Who, who really knows? And I, I certainly don't. I am not an apostolic church father scholar. I do not know. But I think that seems probably unlikely that the Quakerism, even of the early, uh, early, early Quaker, uh, early, early Quaker period looked similar to um, uh, the early church. Maybe it did. I hope it did. I think that'd be great, but I don't know. So I'm going to be saying, I'm going to be looking at it from the perspective that Quakerism started in the 1650s in England. And we, we're just going to roll with that. And if that upsets a few people, I hope I've kind of explained why I think that. Um, and if you disagree with it, let me know. So in terms of the influences of Quakerism, of, or what influenced Quakerism to come into being, I'm looking, or especially in the 1650s in England, I'm looking at four main things. I'm going to be looking at Pentecost. I'm going to be looking at the Reformation, the English Civil War, and the, um, and I suppose, I don't know why I put this at the end, but, well, I suppose because it's about the end times, but uh, the book of Revelation. And I think without those four things, Quakerism would look very different. So I'm going to be going through those one by one, kind of talking about why I think they're important 
in influencing Quakerism and um, or certainly the beginnings of Quakerism, not even necessarily saying that these thing, these four things are important for Quakerism today, though I think for the most part they are, but certainly for the origins of Quakerism, for the, 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 I'd say these four things are the catalysts for Quakerism coming about. And if you have any more, throw them at me and I'll do the video again if needs be. So we'll start off with Pentecost then. So Pentecost uh, comes from, uh, I think, the Greek for 50. So it's 50 days, I think, either after the resurrection or de resurrection of Jesus or death of Jesus or the ascension of Jesus or one of those, um, but very close to the time of Jesus. So Mary, mother of Jesus, was there and all the disciples were there and things like that. So um, we're going, we are going back right to the start of the Christian church. So hopefully I'm weighing these two sides up but it's more as to what Pentecost was and what it represented and how that looks in Quaker worship that I think has particular resonance and particular influence on the um uh on the introduction of Quakerism in the 1650s in England so Pentecost uh, is described in the Bible and it's in the book of Acts which is the first book after the four gospels um it's I think, I'm not sure if this is a fact, but I think it is assumed that it's written by the same person who wrote Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Um, and it basically explains, like, it's basically like the sequel. What did they do, all do then? Where did they all go? And so this is Pentecost. And so this is coming from chapter two. I'm reading from the King James Bible. It's the only one I have. Uh, so if it sounds outdated and, you know, that's that's why. So it goes like this. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So far so good. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the reason why I think this is really important is because to, to, to me that's a Quaker meeting, quite simply. Um, the idea of um, people coming together in people's houses, early Quakers met in people's houses. You know, today we might have meeting houses specifically designed for meetings for worship, but in the early days those buildings obviously didn't exist, so they were meeting in each other's houses. And uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they started speaking in tongues so that all could understand them. Now, you know, I'm not going to necessarily go into the literalism of all that or, you know, whatever. But I think for Quakers, I think that was really important, this idea that that's kind of what they wanted their meetings to look like. They wanted their meetings to be enlivened by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit or Jesus or the inner light coming into their meetings. I like it that it's described as fire and lights. I think that's nice. Um, and that they speak with other tongues, that they speak not necessarily with their own understanding or their own um, coming from themselves, but coming from without, something coming um, that they've been given kind of like this power to speak in a way that can convince and um, touch others in a way that they couldn't necessarily by themselves. I think that's a very Quaker perspective in terms of what ministry is, that it's not you speaking about what you want to, it's that you're being imbibed with this um with this light or this direction from the spirit in order to talk to others in a way that maybe you wouldn't buy them by yourself so this was very important for what quakers believe that their meetings were doing uh they were actively seeing themselves as going i think this is when uh, william penn was talking about primitive quakerism primitive christianity revived this is precisely what he was talking about he was wanting to go back to this kind of worship which you know if it's you know i think that it you know, that sort of worship is surely what every church would like to go back to. And, you know, they would also argue that no one's been baptized here, no one's been uh, sharing bread and wine and all that sort of stuff. They're just, as far as we know, meeting in the house. The fact that there isn't, that, you know, whether there was bread and wine there isn't said, but it's seemingly not important in this, in this precise extract. So in terms of if that's what they're basing their worship on, then, then no need for that. So I think, in terms of what a Quaker meeting looks like and in terms of their ideal and to what purpose their meeting holds, um, I think Pentecost is absolutely essential for early friends in their understanding of how they wanted worship to look. The second big influence on Quakerism was, without question, the Reformation. This is probably the big one, really. So the Reformation 
a lot later. <laughs> Traditionally started in 1517 when Martin Luther uh, nailed up his theses. Um, but it's not actually the Reformation of Luther, which I think is particularly pertinent for, certainly not for English uh, Protestantism as a whole, really, because Henry VIII famously hated him and vice versa. And also uh, because the Lutheran Reformation was actually quite conservative. Um, and looks, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm friends with quite a few Lutherans, and if you go to a Lutheran service, it looks pretty Catholic, to be honest. So it's not that Reformation that I would say influences Quakerism too much. I think we have to look to Switzerland, uh, in, and in particular to the city of Geneva. So this kind of idea of Reformation was happening, well, I mean, strangely in the German-speaking countries, but, you know, it's just the way it is. But this idea of wanting to reform the church, noticing that it, there are lots of things that are wrong with the current state of the Catholic Church, and... Uh, that they were wanting to change, but this wasn't necessarily all directed by Luther. There were quite a few um, uh, Swiss, there were people in Switzerland, for example, quite famously, who uh, were doing similar things, and they did meet to try and work if they could work together, and it turned out that they couldn't because the Swiss uh, reformers were way more, wanting to reform way more than, than Luther was willing to. So um, they kind of sep went on their separate ways. So I would say reformed faith that came out of Switzerland, which became the Reformed Church, so United Reformed Church um, in England, for example, but also lots of other um, uh, movements as well came directly from there. You could argue that the Church of England was heavily influenced by this as well. You could uh, Presbyterianism was definitely uh, was um, definitely influenced by by this teaching. Um, out of Geneva as well. So it's it's kind of, it's not just Quakerism, which was influenced by uh, the Geneva teaching, but it was certainly uh, very, it, it was certainly more influential than say Lutheranism. So effectively, yes, they were looking to reform the Catholic church and by so doing the church, the Catholic church took them out and they set up their own churches. So I suppose this kind of lays the seed for what Quakers would doing from the Church of England. Um, they were noticing lots of, basically that they thought it was um, filled with all these rituals and outward stuff that was unnecessary and they broke from it. Similar kind of thing to what um, the reformers were doing. But it's also the teachings of the um, uh, the, Swiss, uh, the Swiss reformers that became very important. So the most famous um, reformer in uh, Geneva, certainly, but probably in the whole of Switzerland, to be honest, was John Calvin. He was a Frenchman that came to live in Geneva and uh, set up effectively what is now known as Calvinism. And uh, his type of Protestantism that was very different in many ways from Lutheranism, which was obviously the Reformed or Protestantism that came from Luther, uh, it focused on the supremacy of God above everything else, and um, that humans can do absolutely nothing to um, earn their salvation, or to, or that nothing that they can do is of any worth. Really, God has decided everything, uh, because God is supreme. Nothing can top God. Nothing that we can do can have any effect on what God has already decided or what God will do. Which leads to probably their most famous um, original. I'm not sure how many, if Reformed, necessarily believe that now, or if they've qualified it somewhat. But effectively, the idea of double predestination comes in. So that if God is so powerful and all-knowing, then he already knows who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, and he's already decided. And if he knows who's going to heaven, therefore he also knows who's going to hell. So you have this idea of the, of the saved and the reprobate. And um, people were very stressed out about whether or not they were saved or if they were reprobate. They wouldn't necessarily know, obviously. And this teaching spread uh, from Geneva to England, um, especially under Edward VI, so Henry, the, Henry VIII's son, uh, went to, or then all of the English um, Protestants then went back when Mary, who was a Catholic, came to the throne and then came back again and caused a lot of issues for um, Elizabeth um, after her. Um, however, it was in James the Sixth or first reign when um, this was really allowed, and this became effectively 
the 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 in many ways the Church of England, uh, this uh, Swiss Reformed version of uh, the Christian faith became uh, very common in England, and these people were called Puritans. Now, you might think, well, wow, um, that does not sound very Quaker, um, this whole idea of God knows who's going to hell, and he's going to put you there, um, and you don't know, um, and you can do nothing about it. That doesn't sound very Quaker. Um, however, um, it's kind of us a fight back against a lot of what the Puritans were saying that Quakers care about, or also rather kind of taking Puritanism and taking it to a more literal extreme, depending on how you want to see that. There's a, I don't know, I'm not, it's probably apocryphal, I don't know who actually said it, but the idea that um, the Puritans came to purify the Church of England, the Quakers came to purify the Puritans. You know, it, it, it's not, it's not say, I'm not saying for a minute that Quakerism is sort of like similar to Puritanism. Uh, or you know this reformed teaching i'm saying that it was coming out of this out of this milieu this religious uh, feeling sentiment in england at the time it was with the puritans that quakers had a lot of their early sort of debates with so for example on the inerrancy of scripture and uh, this idea of predestination as well whether uh, and what role humanity has in its own salvation if any at all quakers would say we do um or they, to be honest early quakers don't necessarily go well different quakers would say different things i think quakers would kind of probably find a middle way um of the idea of this of the inner light of the inner seed especially as um uh, barclay saw it where it isn't human it isn't humans doing that doing the saving but by working with their inner seed that's placed within them and listening to that, that they can earn their salvation. So kind of a middle way. So whilst, yeah, not the same and, and, oft, and often very completely polar opposite to um, Puritanism, that sort of molded Quakerism into it trying to formulate its own ideas. It, that was who they could, you know, debate against. And so by doing that, saying, oh, so they're like, you know, they're like that. I, we disagree with that because of this. It helped f formulate a lot of their beliefs as to what they were actually protesting against in breaking away from that kind of church. So the third um, influence for the starting of Quakerism, I would say, is the English Civil War. I think it's pretty fair to say that, well, probably quite a lot of um Quite a lot would be different if the English Civil War didn't happen, but I think Quakerism probably would have looked very different or come at a very different time, if at all, if the English Civil War didn't, uh, didn't happen. I think it would be very difficult to imagine it without that background. So just a rough background, um, basically, depends how you want to do it. When I was at school, it was kind of, the religion wasn't really the thing that was really taught about. It was mainly taught about uh, the divine right of kings. So should Charles I, who was king at the time, is he um, directed by God to rule? And if he is, therefore, can he basically do what he wants? Or is he restricted by parliament? That's effectively how we were taught it. And the two sides differed on that because Charles I was trying to push through a lot of stuff that people didn't want. And he was saying, well, I'm king. I'm going to do it anyway. Parliament said, no, that's illegal. You have to do what we say. He disagreed. But um, relig religiously, also quite an interesting period, which, as I said, I, in English schools, I mean, if anyone else thinks otherwise, I'd, we weren't really, that didn't really factor in too much. We talked about it, uh, the different religious groups that came up at that time, but it was the, the religious side of the English Civil War is so important. And yet something that actually I don't think we really talked about. In this, I, I think you, it's fairly easy to say that Charles I was very much in the idea of this high Anglicanism of and verging on Catholicism. So his wife was Catholic, and he was very much. I mean, I'm I'm not sure if he was actually ever, you know, made Catholic or anything like that. But it, there was certainly heavy suspicions that he was Catholic, and the nobles again pr probably m mostly came from this idea of more uh, a more elaborate traditional style of Anglicanism than maybe those in um, in Parliament who were more likely to be leaning towards this Puritanism that we were talking about before. And so a very different idea of culture, really. I mean, even though they're all Englishmen, 
well, I mean, Charles I was Scott, but you know what I mean. In So it kind of did become a high Anglicanism, Catholicism versus more extreme Puritanism, uh, well, Puritanism and uh, Protestantism on the side of the Parliament. Uh, and the Parliament ultimately, through many twists and turns, is victorious um, uh, and Oliver Cromwell is set up as Lord, eventually as Lord Protector and it, throughout all this period it was considered a very apocalyptic time, Apocaly apo apocalyptic literature was everywhere which kind of will feed into my last point and they tr people truly did believe that the world was ending, that this was it and so that therefore if the world was ending people who, who are highly read in the Bible were looking for the second coming of Christ and this very much feeds into Quakerism for two reasons. I'll, so I'll go with the second coming. I'll talk about that in um, the last bit. But in terms of how the, what the culture of the Civil War did for Quakerism was that in this highly stressful environment, to put it mildly, there emerged many different sects, I suppose we could call them, of all of branching off this Puritan strand and they were very influential in the army and so there were there were loads of them i mean not many have existed have carried on until today but um you know the fifth monarchy men um the muggletonians probably having the best name uh the diggers all these kind of um ideas were coming up um relig uh, and religious groups were being formed that with the ascension of Oliver Cromwell, really were allowed to, uh, relatively allowed to thrive because, um, and so it became in that, in that sort of environment of very stressful, um, very apocalyptic, but with a certain degree of religious tolerance um, for, Puritan, for Puritans and Protestants, not for Catholics, but for uh, Protestants, um, Quakerism was allowed to flourish. Now, it was horribly, horribly repressed at, um, when Charles II came in the restoration of the monarchy. But in that time, but by then it was it was already a good decade into itself, so it had already managed to gain a lot of traction. Uh, so I think that highly unstable environment led to uh, was a good was a good sort of soil for Quakerism to sprout. Um, and especially that they were, from very early on, a peaceful, non-militant group of people. I think probably very nice after you know either having very angry, very um, violent sects and violent times to have a, a, a group of people who were all, pretty much always uh, trying to promote peace. But yeah, I think that's the English Civil War. It, it, I don't think you can disassociate the. Uh, the emergence of Quakerism and the English Civil War at all. The last big influence, I think, on the starting of Quakerism is, as I said, the Book of Revelation. So the Book of Revelation is the uh, last book of the Bible. It is about the end of the world. And uh, the second coming of Christ plays a big part of that. And now, as I said, because of the background that Quakers found themselves in in the in the sixteen in the sixteen fifties, they did think that the end of the world was coming, and that wasn't re and that is quite a Protestant idea. So that that filters through all the time throughout the Reformation. There have been people who thought that the end was coming, and how they would react to that, and they thought that Jesus was coming, and all this. Um, but I think it's particularly important to Quakers, and um, quite simply because they actually thought that it. Because some people kind of thought that, okay, things will get really bad and there'll be this period of things being really bad and then Jesus will come and there'll be, you know, all this and then people will be separated into the damned and the saved and all that. Whereas Quakers turned around and said, no, Jesus is already here. He's in our meetings. Uh, that's what they expected the um, the second coming to be, that the second coming wasn't a physical thing that... Christ wasn't necessarily, though I'm not sure they were against the idea that he would come in the flesh, I'm not sure. But definitely the idea was that it was an inward coming, that the sec the first coming was him in the flesh, uh, in order to basically say that, you know, worship in the spirit. And then because 
his second coming was in spirit. So in their meetings, that second coming was happening. It was an apocalyptic meeting, but not necessarily in that, you know, everything was falling apart and the world was ending around them. But that idea that the second coming was already here. It wasn't something to be waiting for. It was already right here, right now. So if you wanted to listen to Jesus, you needed to be coming to a Quaker meeting because you weren't going to be hearing him in a, a Catholic mass or anything like that because that's just the priest talking away and not you actually centering down and listening to Christ and what he's wanting you to do. So George Fox was heavily influenced by um, by the book of Revelation in particular. This This idea of Quakerism as an apocalyptic sect, I think, which nowadays sounds very, very ominous, but in, in their time, considering things were already pretty ominous, that was precisely what they wanted, and that's what they precisely thought was happening. So yes, I think those four things, the Pentecost, the Reformation, the English Civil War, and the Book of Revelation, without those, Quakerism would either not have happened, or would have looked very, very different. And so, yeah, if you think there are any other things that you think would not would mean that Quakerism would look very, very different or would look very different or wouldn't happen at all, let me know. So stay tuned then. So I'm going to be doing another video about the origins of Quakerism. So how Quakerism began in uh, the 1650s in England. And then we'll probably, yeah, we'll probably look at the, uh, like the first generation friends, maybe second generation friends can have a second or third video also themselves. And we'll talk about that then. So thanks very much for watching. We'll see you again soon. Thank you very much for watching the video. If you liked it, please do click on the thumbs up and the subscribe button to get more videos about Quakerism in the UK today. It really does help and thanks once again.